Thanks to each of you who um, read and signed for us today. Very appreciated. A reminder that there are people throughout the world who are worshiping God today around communion tables and in other ways. Not only today, but throughout the year, people are worshiping God in different kinds of places, from cathedrals to huts to even outdoors. Thanks to each of you once again. And I want to thank Maureen O'Brien for this beautiful decoration up here today, for the breads and for uh, cloth across the communion table. She is the one who decorated. Would you express appreciation to Maureen? Thank you, Maureen. Let us pray. Speak to us here today, source of unity, and teach us to be one. One in love for all people, one in understanding with all people, and one in peace with all your children of the earth. Amen. If you are married, or have been married, or you've been to a wedding, in all likelihood you have heard the words of 1 Corinthians 13, which we have heard today. Appropriately so, after all, it's often called the love chapter. But when Paul wrote these words as part of his letter to the church of Corinth, he did not send the letter to a minister of the church so the minister would have something to read at a wedding. He wasn't talking about love in the sentimental way that we often hear it sung and on thousands and thousands of Hallmark cards. Paul was addressing division in the church. The church of Corinth was the most argumentative and cantankerous church of any of the churches to which letters are written in the New Testament. There were power struggles and huge egos that could barely be squeezed under one roof. The church members argued over a number of things. One of those was who was the most spiritual. And they argued over whose gifts were the best for the church. Paul was never one to mince words, as you probably know. So in his letter, he basically said, don't you realize how ridiculous you're being? It was in the middle of addressing the church at Corinth that he plopped down these words in his letter that we have heard today. In essence, Paul said, no matter who, how much we offer our praises to God in worship, no matter how much we have intelligence, no matter how deeply we believe, no matter how much we contribute financially to the church, no matter our level of involvement in the church, none of these things is of any value if we don't demonstrate love. Paul says in those familiar words, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Imagine what it would be like if the world used Paul's words as a recipe. On this World Communion Sunday, we are acutely aware that what was happening in Corinth is widespread in our world today. There really is a lack of civility. Do you know where there is a lack of civility in every community in the United States? It's on our roads and highways. People can get obnoxious when they are behind the wheel of a car. I used to be, I no longer am. The comedian George Carlin used to say, have you ever noticed that anyone who drives faster than you is a maniac? And anyone who drives slower than you is an idiot. The way that many people treat each other when they are behind the wheel of a car reflects the way they treat each other once they get out from behind the wheel of a car. What are some of the things that are the keys to making our churches and other places of worship and communities and states and nations and world more civil? Helen and Henley Barnett's experience may teach us something. Henley was one of my professors at my alma mater in seminary. He and his wife lived in Louisville, Kentucky. They had two sons. 
It was during the Vietnam War, a war that divided the United States and sometimes families. You have to go back almost 160 years to the Civil War to find a war that divided the United States to the extent that the Vietnam War did. And we haven't had that kind of vision over war since then, it seems. Helen and Henley's son, John, enlisted and joined the Air Force. He had been raised in the church. He believed that his decision was consistent with his faith commitment. He was not a hawk or a warmonger in his convictions. He simply felt that he was duty-bound to follow the letter of the law. Helen and Henley's other son, Wayne, refused to register for the draft. He had been raised in the church. He believed that his decision was consistent with his faith commitment. He believed that Jesus was a pacifist, so Jesus' followers should be also. Wayne stayed true to his convictions. It meant that he felt he had to leave the United States and he felt that he may never return again. His wife and he moved to Sweden. Some said that they were commies. Some supported him, even though they thought that his commitment was wrong. Some agreed with his position and supported him. What about John and Wayne's parents? People asked them, do you support John or Wayne? And they said both. How could they? Or maybe, how couldn't they? Wayne's story hit the Louisville newspaper and even the New York Times, and then it made its way to the local television news. That's when Wayne's parents began to receive anonymous hate mail. The FBI authorities showed up on their doorstep looking for their son. Where is he, they asked, and they told the truth. He's in Sweden. Wayne's mother received an outpouring of support from her colleagues at the middle school where she taught English. The day after the story hit the papers, one of her colleagues placed a card on her desk before Helen came to school. It was signed by Helen's colleague and his wife, and it was accompanied by some roses that they had picked from their garden. The card said, we love and support Henley and you. He was a World War II veteran who had taught both John and Wayne. One of the older teachers came quietly into Helen's room, slipped his arms around her and said, I just had to come see you. Helen says that this friend couldn't have disagreed more with Wayne's action. Henley received the same kind of outpouring from his colleagues at the seminary. But the seminary switchboard buzzed with calls from RA persons who insisted that Henley should be fired, that he wasn't fit to teach in their denomination's seminary. How could people be so supportive and caring while others were damning? The vast majority of those who supported Helen and Henley knew them personally and in some instances knew their sons. On the other hand, the vast majority of those who were mean-spirited and even worse did not know the Barnett family. Closely related to this fact is that the vast majority who knew them and did not agree with Wayne's decision could accept their differences. And the vast majority who did not know them and did not agree with Wayne were angry at Wayne and his parents. They could not handle the fact that someone who differed from them on a position over which they were so passionate, they just couldn't handle it. The members of the church at Corinth may have thought that they knew each other pretty well. In all likelihood, some of them were even related. It wouldn't surprise me if there were families that were divided. But even if they were related, there is a good chance that they didn't really know each other because they weren't listening to each other. You can't love someone if you don't listen to them. Imagine if people who were at odds with each other took time to listen to each other and hear each other. We would begin to see others' humanity. 
Instead of avoiding each other, what if we were to sit down and really listen to each other? We might still disagree, but if we took love into the room, maybe we could leave the room, maybe not as best friends, but perhaps with a little more respect for each other. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. On this World Communion Sunday, we can also realize that all of us in the church are called to love each other because we are part of the same family. Those at the church at Corinth had forgotten that. As we gather around the communion table, we realize that there are Christians in the Atlanta area and on the other side of the world who are gathering as part of a worldwide observance. They are part of our family as surely as we at Central are family. But communion also points to a larger truth that not only are all Christians family, but all people are family. Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, people of other faith traditions and no faith traditions are God's children. We are family. Fred Craddock, whose stories I share from time to time, maybe often, was invited to the University of Winnipeg in Canada one mid-October to give two lectures, one on Friday night and one on Saturday morning. Before he made his trip, he asked the host what kind of weather should he dress for. He was told that it was too early for really cold weather, but he might want to bring a jacket. Fred gave the lecture on Friday night. As he left the lecture hall with the host, it was beginning to spit snow. His host was surprised. The next morning, there was two feet of snow. The phone rang in the motel room and his host said, we're all surprised by this. We've had to cancel this morning's lecture. Even the airport is closed. I'm sorry that I can't come and get you for breakfast, but if you can make your way around the corner, there's a little dust bus depot and it has a cafe that might be open. Fred put on his jacket. It was nothing. He got his little cap and put it on. It didn't even help in the room. He went into the bathroom and unrolled long sheets of toilet paper and made a nest in his cap so it would protect his head against the icy wind. He went outside. The wind was cold. The snow was deep. He slid and tromped his way through the snow and finally made it around the corner to the bus depot and that cafe. And every stranger in Western Canada was there, pressing and pushing and loud. Fred finally made a place to sit down, found a place, and after a lengthy time, a man in a greasy apron came over. He, and Fred asked, may I have a menu? The man in the greasy apron said, we have soup. Do you want soup? <laughs> Fred said, that's what I was going to order, soup. The man brought the soup and Fred put his spoon in it. It was the awfulest soup he had ever tasted in his life. It was kind of gray looking. It was so bad that he couldn't possibly eat it. But he sat there and put his hand around the bowl. It was warm so he sat there with his head down and his head wrapped in the toilet paper bemoaning his outcast state with this awful soup. But it was warm, so he clutched it and stayed there, bent over his soup stove. Then the door opened. The wind was icy, and somebody yelled, close the door. In came a woman clutching her little coat. She found a place to sit, and the man in the greasy apron came over. What do you want? She said, a glass of water. He brought the water, then he said, now do you want some soup? That's all I've got. She said, I just want the water. You have to order. Well, I just want the water. Look, I've got paying customers. 
She said, just a glass of water and a place to stay warm. He got loud about it. Look, there are people that are paying here. If you're not going to order, you've got to leave. So she got up to leave, and almost as if rehearsed, everybody in that little cafe stood up and started for the door. Fred got up and he thought, I'm voting for something here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and the man in the greasy apron said, all right, all right, she can stay. Everybody sat down and he brought soup over to her as well. And Fred said to the man sitting there by him, who is she? And he said, I never saw her before, but I figure if she ain't welcome, ain't nobody welcome place got quiet. But Fred heard the slurping of that soup, that awful soup, and he thought, I'm going to try it again. He put his spoon in the soup, and it wasn't that bad. Everybody was eating that soup. He had no idea what kind of soup it was, but he began to think that it tasted just a little bit familiar. Then it dawned on him. It tasted just a little bit like bread and wine. Just a little bit like bread and wine. If she ain't welcome, ain't nobody welcome because all are part of God's family.